All right, so does everyone remember what we were talking about last week? What were we talking about? Um, what were we talking about, Jim Boy? Jim remembers. You're, oh, amen. Thank you, Lord. God is good. So what did we talk about on Sunday last week? We talked about grace. Grace, didn't we? Favor, that's right. The favor of our God. And we were looking at, unfortunately, some of the things that are not grace and things we need to really understand and get within us. But today we're going to look at the grace of God and continuing in the grace of God. Remember this word, it means favor or unmerited favor. It's something, guess what, guys? I don't deserve and you don't deserve. Okay? It is a gift from our Heavenly Father. It is this miraculous thing that God extends to mankind. When mankind, what do we deserve? What do we deserve? Death, judgment, separation. But God, does he extend his mercy, his grace, his loving kindness? Does he continually extend it to mankind? Guys, does he? Has anyone noticed the Lord is very good at that? And many times, what does mankind do? We even spit in his face. We turn away from him. We do the most vile things. But is God still faithful? He cannot deny himself. It is his characteristics. Yet, by no means will he leave the guilty unpunished. We'll look at that as well. So in Exodus 34, if we're going to talk about grace, right? We have to get this in our head. We went through this last week. I'm not re-preaching my message. If you didn't, if you weren't here, I encourage you, go on YouTube. We put all the messages on YouTube. Also, all the guys from New York and all the guys from Texas are up there as well. So I encourage you, listen and grow in knowledge and teaching, okay? But in that, we talked about how there is this misconception, actually a demonic lie, if you want to say, from Satan to separate the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament was angry. The God of the Old Testament was vindictive. The God of the Old Testament held grudges, and he was in a bad mood, right? And he was very judgmental. Absolutely. And the God of the New Testament, Jesus, is love. And we looked at, unfortunately, how in the, the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, it says, right, we've received grace upon grace. That the first grace that came was the law of God. That he gave law to mankind. Because without law, what happens to mankind? Go to any country where law uh, is not enforced, what will you find? What are you finding in the Western world as laws are being lost or changed? Disaster. We're seeing disaster because law is favor. It is grace, guys. Can you guys say that? Can you say law is grace? Can you say that? Do you believe that? I hope you do, because it's the truth. This is not me. This is the Word of God, okay? A lot of us have been taught that law is bad. Well, if law is bad, the law of God is bad, then we've got a major problem, because who gave it to us? The lawgiver. So we have to settle this in our hearts. And let's, again, if we're going to talk about the lawgiver, the Father, this is one of the main places I'm always going to go, Exodus 34, 6 to 8. This is, remember, Moses says, Lord, show me your your glory. And does the Father show him his glory? If God was so angry and mean and vindictive, would he have shown this mere mortal his glory? No. He wanted that relationship, that intimacy, not only with Moses, but all of Israel. And guess what? Does he want that same relationship with us? We're going to talk about that in a minute. And in Exodus 34, it says, and the Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, now, if our God, if we say Yahweh, the Lord God Almighty, is our God, and he proclaims something, guess what, guys? You need to pay attention. And if you are not paying attention, there's a problem. Because this is our God, the Lord overall, proclaiming. When he speaks, we need to then what? Yes, Dad, what are you saying? The Lord, the Lord God, what is he? Compassionate. What's the next word? And... So is grace a New Testament concept? No way. Is grace something that came in Christ Jesus? No way. Is grace something that has been revealed through the church? No it is God's characteristic. I don't know about you. Me and Jim have had this conversation. Do you know I find actually a lot more grace, if you want to say, all through the kingdom period than I do in the New Testaments. Do you know how many times God showed Israel such favor when they did not deserve it?
And we're back. All right. So the Lord, was he gracious all throughout the ages? As I was saying with Israel, over and over again, we see his grace given to mankind. Okay? His mercy. He's compassionate. He's gracious. Slow to anger. Abounding in love and kindness and truth. Who gives loving kindness for thousands. Who keeps loving kindness for thousands. Who forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sin. So before Christ Jesus, were people forgiven their, for their iniquities, their transgressions, and their sin? Absolutely. By the sacrificial system. How are we forgiven? By the sacrificial system. The sacrifice just changed. We no longer have to bring a bull or a lamb or all those things. Now we have the perfect propitiation, sacrifice that continues for all time in Christ Jesus. Okay? Nothing changed. Do you know what changed? The sacrifice. The requirements were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. All right? He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. All right? So the Lord forgives. He is gracious. Yet... He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. So is the Lord just? He is just. Is Jesus just? Is he the judge, guys? When he came, did he say, I wish the, kind uh, the fire, I wish it was kindled? Did he long actually even to bring his righteous judgment? He did. But did the Lord then extend favor, not only to Israel, but to all mankind for the last 2,000 years? That there would be a massive ingathering, harvest, coming to know the Lord. Absolutely. So what do we see? Does God change, guys? All throughout, the Lord says, I am the Lord and I change not. And if we think he has changed or we have two different gods when we read the New Testament and the Old Testament, then it's not us. Sorry, it's not him who has the problem. It's actually us. And we need to have our mind renewed and we need to ask the Lord to help us to see the scriptures correctly. And how do we interpret the scriptures? By the power of his Holy Spirit. And if we are not seeing correctly, guess what, guys? It means we are reading the scriptures, can I be honest here, through the lens of our flesh. If we have a problem when we read the Old Testament, well, God shouldn't have done that, or this shouldn't have happened, or this and this and this. It's not the Holy Spirit who's interpreting that. It's actually your flesh. And if your flesh isn't interpreting the word of God, guess what will come about? What we see all throughout history in the church Erroneous doctrines, heresies, all different confusion. Why? Because we don't want to let this read us. We want to read it, and we want to interpret it to suit our desires. Where we need to say, Lord, no, it reads me. And I receive it. And even the things I don't understand, the things I don't like, the things that are complicated. Do you know there's really complicated things, guys? Do you know that Peter teaches us that Paul, when he talks about the coming of the Lord, it's complicated. And do you know what he says? The untable, unstable excuse me, and the untaught, guess what they do? They distort the teaching as they do all the rest of Scripture. So if we are unstable, do you know we can be unstable, guys? Okay, do you know we can be tossed back and forth? But if we are built on Christ Jesus, and then we are being taught on the rock, what will happen? We will have a firm foundation. And we won't be tossed back and forth by every trickery of doctrine and deception, as Paul says, okay? So God the Father is the same all throughout, just as the Holy Spirit is, just as the Son is. In number 6, 22 through 27, this is the ironic blessing, and I'm just doing this again to show God's grace has always been extended towards more mankind. This is what the priests were to pray uh, when they sought the Lord. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak to, the son, uh, speak to Aaron and his son, saying, thus you shall bl bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face. Has anyone noticed the song that we sing? We say, his face shine on us. Make his face shine on you and be what? Be gracious to you. When was this? This was through Moses, the lawgiver. That God spoke through Moses to tell the Levitical priestly line. How are they to pray? This is who God is. And we are asking for him to then reveal himself in a greater way. May he be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. So they shall invoke my name on the sons of Israel. And I will. What will he do? Okay, now I'm not a Levite. But am I a leader of God? So do I invoke the name of the Lord on you? 
without the yeah. <laughs> to a degree, yes, Jim. Okay. I am, yes. Okay. Spiritually, yes. So the point is that in that place, what happens? We invoke the name of the Lord, don't we? We teach the congregation. And as you guys receive it, what happens? You're blessed. We're blessed, guys. Because we're receiving the knowledge and the truth and who our God is. And we receive what? His grace. We receive His light. We receive His peace. And we receive a blessing because we know who our God is. Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. All right, again, I'm just hammering this home. We have to make sure that this grace message, we don't think it's just this verse. Ephesians 2, if we start talking about grace, this is where everyone's going to go. And I'm going there as well because it's completely true. But has God always been gracious? Did God show favor all the way in the beginning with Adam and Eve? Could God have brought about what he said in a different way when he said, when you eat from that tree, you will surely, could they have just died? Could he have wiped out mankind? But he had another plan. And of course, we know death entered into these mortal bodies. Time and all of that came into being and consequence for sin. But did he just, then and there, dead, no more mankind? So what did he extend to them? Grace. They didn't deserve that. He could have by what he spoke. I am the Lord, and one thing we know he can't do is lie. He could have wiped them out and said, that's it, I'm done with them. And I just love thinking about that because it's absolutely mind-boggling because did God see Cain and Abel? Did God see all the things that would happen in the days of Noah with the Nephilim and the fallen angels and the depravity that God searched all mankind and he found who? Noah. One man. He said he looked at all mankind and what was constantly in their heart. Violence, wickedness, abominations, idolatry. And the Lord, did he rescue Noah? And then did he know from Noah what would happen next? Did he know the Tower of Babel would come, guys? Did he know? He knew all of it. And did he still extend his grace, his favor to mankind, his mercy, his loving kindness? In Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, of course we're going here. And you were dead. If you have received this, say, we're dead. dead. I was dead. I, yeah, I was dead. Correct way there, right? I was dead because I used to practice all the things that led to death. You stop. (laughs) Proper English, anyway. (laughs) In your trespasses and sin in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Who is that? Satan. Satan. All right. So where is Satan? We actually did this in Bible school. The prince in the air. He's not here on the earth. Okay, good theology here. If you have questions about that, come to Bible school. And he's working now in the sons of who? Okay. Jesus was the obedient son. So as followers of Christ, what are we called to be? Obedient sons. If we're walking in disobedience or do... oh. Something that gets under my skin, guys. People come to me and say, Jesus was a rebel. That is a heresy from the pit of hell. I'm going to call that out. That is rubbish. Jesus was not a rebel. Jesus did not rebel once. Jesus was the suffering servant, the completely obedient son to the Lord. Guys, could he have called down his angels and wiped out the Roman government? Yeah, he could have, couldn't he? Even when they came to seize him in the garden, he said, you know, guys, I can do that. But did he? No. Did he speak back to Pilate and say, Pilate, do you know why you're there? I'm God. You bow down to me. Did he do any of that? Could he have done that? But he didn't because he was the perfect, obedient son. So as we, absolutely, of his father, as we follow the obedient son, we are called to be obedient sons. And if we are not obedient to the Lord, then what happens? Disobedience comes in. And guys, who was the first one to rebel? I don't know about you. I do not want to be associated with him in any way. All right? So if there's any rebellion in us, who will it lead us to? Who will start to work within us? Not the Holy Spirit, guys. It will not produce good fruit. It will actually produce within us disobedience. All right? Do you know what the scriptures say about disobedience? Do you know under the law, if we're going to go there... If we went to Romans 1 right now, do you know what God says about disobedience? It actually deserves death. Now, have we received grace? Have we received a time where the theocracy, the law of God is not 
inactive, uh, if you want to say, by the church. It's not our job to carry that out. But do you know what happened if somebody was disobedient, a reviler of their parents under the law? Death. And some of you might be going, whoa, 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 that's not grace. Yes, it actually is. Because it was somebody who would then continue in their wicked ways. They were corrected. It wasn't just death. They had opportunity to repent, but they would not repent. They continued in their disobedient ways. And what would happen then to the rest of the congregation, the assembly? What happens, guys, when you have one rebellious teenager and he hangs out with the rest of the teenagers? Only the one stays rebellious. Yeah. Before you know it, you know you end up with? You end up with stories like Sodom and Gomorrah. You end up with stories like what happened in Israel, what happened during the judges period. So the point is, these things, they deserve death, but God has extended us grace. But the scarier things is if we walk in disobedience, is there eternal death? Yeah, we look at natural death like, oh no, God would kill somebody. Well, how much more, if you want to say, if we do not obey the Lord and walk in disobedience, is there eternal death? And is that terrifying? And should that put a godly fear within us? Not that I have a fear of, oh no, I'm going to hell if I die today. But if I continue to walk in disobedience, what will happen? I will walk outside the favor, the grace of my God, and go down a really dangerous path. And can I be severed from the Lord? I can, and I'm going to prove that to you with Scripture in one minute. So it says here, among them, we too, formerly. Everyone say, formerly. If it's not formally, then today is the day to, for you to say formally and change your course of direction. Repent. Formerly lived at the lust of our flesh, indulging and in desires of the flesh and of mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That God's wrath, who does it rest on? The unrighteous, the wicked. But does God want to pour out his wrath on the unrighteous and the unwicked? He doesn't want to, guys, but because he's just, will he? Does he have to bring it about? He does. But is his desire for the unrighteous and the wicked to repent and be saved? That's his desire. That's his heart. And if we have judgment in our heart towards people, then we need to ask the Lord, Lord, give me more of your love. Because God's heart is that no one would perish, but all would come to repentance. And if we're going around judge, 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 we're not judge, jury, and executioner, guys. Vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Okay? So he says really quick, but God, everyone say, but God. but God. All right. So we were dead. We were in our trespasses. We were children of wrath, just as all the rest, right? But God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. So this is a good definition of mercy. Remember, we went through it last week. We talked about the difference between grace and mercy. We, we mix them up and we say, oh, grace and mercy, love and kindness. We kind of lump them all together. What is his mercy? His mercy is that picture on the top, the cross. God being rich in mercy, right? Because of his great love for us. Even when we are dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Favor. And raised up with him, seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come, he might show his surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. All right. So when someone gives a gift, what do you have to do? You have to receive it. You have to grab hold of it. The word in the Greek is lambano. It means to seize. It means to take actually by force. If, I, if my son was here right now and I said, Elijah, I got a present for you. You know what he'd do? He'd run up to the front. As soon as I presented it to him, he wouldn't go, can I have it? If I told him I had a present, what's he going to do? As soon as I go like this, oh, he's going to grab it. And what is that? That is faith. He knows that his daddy has a gift for him. And what does he do? He grabs it. And do you know what we are called to be? We're called to be men and women of action. We're called to grab hold of, seize what God has given us. And this amazing thing here is as God has given it to us, then we become witnesses of what God's grace has done in our lives. But if we are not walking in the calling that God has for us, if we're still going around, guys, can we struggle with sin? Can we struggle with sin? Can we be demonically tormented? Can the enemy get a hold of us? He can. 
And if that is our constant state of being, there's a problem. Because it means we haven't really received fully his grace. We haven't fully matured into that place. Do you know Paul in Romans 7, right? Many people misinterpret this verse. And he says, oh, I do the things that I want to do. And there's this battle between his flesh and his spirit. That's not at all what Paul is teaching us. He's not teaching us one moment, I do wicked things. The next moment, I do righteous things. He's saying that's what happens when we strive in our flesh. That's what happens when I try to be saved by righteousness, acts and works and deeds. But as I receive his grace, as I receive his Holy Spirit, who will set me be free from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to Jesus Christ, right? You know, the Lord. And then, no chapter and verse, what does Romans 8 say? For now there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he says, then, how do we know the one is found in Christ Jesus? Because they, he goes on to explain, they're walking by the Holy Spirit. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And as we walk by the Spirit, what will we produce, guys? Bad fruit? Worthless things? No, precious things. We will produce good fruit. The Lord will then, what, start to well up out of us, and we see His grace working within us. But really quickly, let's go to the famous verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. So how do you access that grace? Through faith. Okay? There's this whole thing out there that, you know what, everybody can just access God's grace at any time. Grace is there, grace is there. But how do we access that grace? Through faith. Through believing. Through receiving. Through grabbing hold of it and saying, this is mine. Do you guys remember the parables that Jesus told us about the kingdom? What did he say? It's like a man who goes and what? He finds a treasure. It's like a man who goes and he finds a pearl. And what do they do? Sell everything. everything. And what do they do? They buy the field. They get the pearl. They go all in because they say, you know what? Everything else pales in comparison. There is, I've been searching for this my whole life and I've found it. And by faith, they went all in. And I want to tell you right now, guys, faith can be illogical. Do you know what we are? We're very logical. I'm a very logical person. You can ask my wife, all right? I like ducks in a row, and I like seeing how it works and all that. But do you know the Holy Spirit of God and the ways of God, and when true faith comes in, do you know what God says? Do something crazy. (laughs) And we go, no, that makes no sense. Why would you ask me to do that? I'll give you a testimony. We were going on a trip to Israel. We didn't have the money. It was a mission trip. This was several years ago, and we didn't know how we were going to get there, but God told us to do it. In faith, we stepped out. We did it, and we expect. Now, we had one. We've had this multiple times happen. One time, somebody came to our door. The day of, we had put it all on the credit card. Foolishness, right? And they come to the door, and what do they do? How much was the trip? What do you need for extra? Wrote up the check and handed it to us right then and there. Now, that's the way I would like it to happen every time. (laughs) But guess what? There was another trip, and we didn't have the money. And we, in faith, said, oh, God, you want us to go? And guess what happened that time? That time, I'm on my way home from work, and I'm driving, and we come to a light, and I had this old pickup truck, and I got the green light. I started to go through. These kids who were high, they were doing drugs, cut out right in front of us, and what happens? Boom. And get out of the car. Oh, no. And I had actually Jen, who's coming to visit us, Michael's wife. We worked at the same company. We were on our way home from work. And we get out of the car oh, and got limped at home, put it into the driveway. Obviously, it wasn't my fault. Nothing like that. And the insurance adjuster comes out, inspects it. And I paid, I think, maybe 800 quid for this thing. Yeah. Piece of rubbish, as we'd say. Okay. And it served me for hmm, probably seven, eight years. Kept it going. But anyway, they come out, and it had a cap on the back, which made it like a Jeep. And the guy comes out. He evaluates it. I'm figuring he's going to do a write-off. Maybe I'll get 500, and I'll have to find something else. And if anything, this is going to be a real hassle. They come out. They evaluate it, and they give me a $6,000 value on the truck. Does that make logical sense? I paid 800 or less for it. I don't remember. They gave me $6,000 for it. Then I bought the truck back for $100, fixed it for $50. So I ended up with $5,850 profit. And guess what that enabled? That enabled our plane tickets and Jen's plane ticket to go to Israel and do the work of God. 
Is God funny? Is his ways not our ways? And we want it in a row. But faith says, step out, trust God. And then what do we receive in that place? Favor. We receive favor. We receive his grace to help us in our time of need. So then he says, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Put a pin in that one. We're going to that one later on. All right? That as we receive his grace, do we just sit around and be, as Jim would say, lazy lumps? All right? Are we called to be couch potato Christians? Mm -mm. And do you know what? There are a lot in the church nowadays. Couch potatoes Christians. Do you know what the main message, unfortunately, we've seen in the worldwide church is it's all about me. Serve me. No, that's not what God says. God says it's all about him. And it's all about this. It's all about the body. We come together, and guys, do we form a body? Do we form a congregation? Do we form an assembly? And every single one of us, I'm glad you're all here today. Are we all needed? Are we all a part of it? And when one goes, does the body hurt? And when one hurts, should we all hurt? When one is blessed, should we all rejoice? We should. And we need to get that in us because that is God's system. That is not mine. That is his. All right, so he continues on here. And that's the point, this gift of God, his grace that has been given to us, extended to us favor that we receive through faith. So if we are lacking in grace, what needs to come up? Our faith. <laughs> you don't hear that. You just hear about grace, grace, grace. God forgives your sin. God forgives your sin. Now, there's a truth to that, guys, but that's not all it is. It's a bigger message than that. His grace enables us. His grace empowers us. His grace is what gives us the ability to go out and do the work that he has called us to do. And it's a free gift, not that I can earn it, but it's my Father who has given it to me. Yes. And I grab hold of it and allow it to then mightily work within me. John 3, 27 says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. This is John the baptizer. And he gives us great theology here. And he learned it, of course, from his father who is a man of the Lord in the temple, okay? And we see here that what? He says, unless it's been given to us. We, we don't have it, guys. What does Jesus say? Unless you stay connected to me, what are we? We, <laughs> we wither, we die. We have nothing. Apart from me, you have nothing. Yeah, nothing at all. So in him, as we come to him, what happens? We start to receive his grace. And this is where we need to be renewed, guys. Do you need his grace once a week? Do you need the favor of God for your life? Every day. Every day. Very good, Gordon. That's right. <laughs> yeah, we sing songs all the time, every moment, I need you, Jesus. I need... But do we really understand that, guys? All right, when we go through, we think of grace. Again, we think of it, we've, we've got this men mentality. There's this saying, I'm going to blow out of the water. Who's ever heard this one? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Who's heard that? Yeah, all the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to implore you, please don't say that one. Because you're not just a sinner. Sinner means practicing sin. Did the Lord set you free? Did we just read in Ephesians 2 that he set us free? Past tense, you were one of those. So then why do we go around saying, I'm just a sinner? No, don't accept that mentality. You're a son who is walking in his grace. You're a co-heir who is walking in favor with God. That's the mentality we have to have. Now, don't become arrogant. Don't become prideful. Stay humble in the Lord, but we do know you to know who we are in Christ Jesus. That we're not just sinners, guys. Christ died to set us free from sin. And if we're not walking in that, then we need more of his grace, his favor. We need more faith. We need to grow in obedience to the will of the Father. So in our daily routine, guys, what do we need to be doing? We need to constantly be coming before his throne of grace. Right? We're going to read that in a second. Psalm 84, 11 says, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives, what does he give? Grace and glory. No good deed does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Is that very simple? And has it changed? No, that's our God. He reveals himself. He says his way. And what does he do? The Lord gives. So if he gives something, what do we daily need to do? We need to come and say, Lord, I need it. All right, what was, uh, the, you know, the, the little kid, right, Tiny Tim? Please, sir, can I have some more? Oh, yeah, sure. 
Oliver, is it Oliver? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that was the great revelation that was poured out in the 90s um, through actually the Toronto Revival. All right, now it got coined all those names and whatever you've heard about it, forget all that. All right, it was a true move of God. And I want to tell you, one of the main things that came out of that movement was a prayer. And do you know what the prayer was? It wasn't some big revelation. It wasn't some hour-long speaking in tongues. Do you know what it was? More Lord. Do you know why you have so many modern worship songs with I need you more, more this, more that? It came from that revival. Because before that, guess what? People were not lingering in the presence of God. There's always a remnant. But if you're older, can anyone remember the older churches? Does anyone remember what the meetings? I'm not that old. I've only read it in history, and I've talked to PJ and Jim and people like that. There was not this hunger and lingering before. A lot of it was just tradition. And it's what they knew, guys. It's what we knew, wasn't it? You went through it. And you know what? Something that was restored specifically through the Toronto Revival was, again, the power of ministry in the laying on of hands. The way that we do ministry, when we call people forward and say, if you need more, come forward. If you need healing, if you need this. Do you know, guys, before that, do you know what there was? Billy Graham, and it was a good thing, altar calls. But altar calls were for salvation. Altar calls were for you to turn your life to Jesus or rededicate your life to Jesus. It was not this massive call to come up and say, you know what? We need more of God. We need more of his presence. We need to grow in relationship and intimacy with him. And through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the mid-90s there, there was this great resurgence, if you want to say, because it had always meant to be that way, of lingering in God's presence. Learning, what did John say over and over again? There's this word he uses because Jesus used it, of course. Abide. All right? And why do we have a meal after our service? Why do we have prayer the way we have prayer? Why do we have a Tuesday Bible school? Why do we have a Thursday night? Why do we have a youth group? So that we would learn to what? Abide with one another. To grow in the faith. To mature with one another. And guys, do you know, I've noticed, myself included, and I had to train my flesh, as I was saying before. Do you know what our flesh has a problem doing? Abiding. Major problem. Because our flesh says, I've got stuff to do. Oh, this is boring. Come on, who's ever been getting prayer and in your head? You're not thinking about God. Come on, can we be real here, guys? <laughs> all right, good man. Right, you're saying, oh, I need sleep. What? Oh, I should have just stayed in bed. We all have these thoughts, guys. But this is why what? We need to discipline our bodies. We need to become more spiritual. Right? We need to become heavenly minded. And if we start to do that, I want to tell you, I remember when I was a young believer, right? We do morning worship and we worship for about an hour. And then have you noticed we do worship here for an hour and we do all these things. And I remember being a young believer and I'm sitting there and I'm like, when's this going to be over? <laughs> and maybe you're still in that place. All right? And I'm not shaming you or anything like that. But the point is, as we grow in love with somebody, okay, in the natural, do we want to spend time with them? Do we want to linger with them? Do we want to abide with them? Yeah. And if we aren't doing that with God, what does it say about our relationship with God? It needs to mature. It needs to grow. As we grow in love with him more and more, guess what? I read the Psalms, and what does David say over and over again? I desire to be in your presence. I desire to be in your temple. I desire to go to bed and what? Meditate. Dwell on the things of the scriptures that I've been reading. His desire is for the Lord. Read Song of Solomon, guys. It's a prophetic book. And what's it about? The desire of the bride and the bridegroom longing to be together, longing to spend time with one another. And if that is not our relationship with the Lord, then we need to grow. We need to mature. We need to ask the Lord for that great love, that great hunger. Because I want to warn you guys, you know what the Lord said at the end of the age would happen? He said most people's love would grow cold. What is that interpretation? He's not talking about the world because did they love God? Did they know God? No, they're lost. They're separate, unfortunately. Can they come to know his love? Can they come to be saved and be reconciled? Absolutely, just as we were. But what's he warning us of? Within the faith, what's going to happen? There's going to be a great cooling off. And I want to tell you guys, you know, cooling off just doesn't happen like that. It happens with one little decision here, one little decision there, one little decision there. And before you know it, what happens? You're lukewarm. And in lukewarm, what does the Lord say? <laughs> I'll spit you out. Because the Lord, has anyone ever noticed the Lord is very passionate? Is he a jealous God? 
Okay? And how are we supposed to feel for him? We're supposed to be on fire. We're supposed to jealously desire him. We're supposed to want him with every part of our being. And let's be honest, guys. I'll throw myself in that boat as well. If I'm saying, and I know you as well, we all need more of that. And if we think we don't, we are in a dangerous place because that's called complacency. And complacency, what does it breed? Right? It does not breed anything good. It actually breeds what? That lukewarm thing. It actually starts to cool us off. And we start to become comfortable. And in that place, what? Our faith starts to dwindle. We start to then doubt and fear and all this rubbish can start to come in. So we need to what? Receive what he gives. And a man can only receive that which is given from? So what is God extending to mankind from heaven? His faith. Uh, favor, his grace. Acts 6, 8, Peter, uh, sorry, no, Stephen here. Stephen, right? And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So what was he full of? Power. So where did that power come from? The Holy Spirit. The outpouring in Acts that we read about. Have we received that outpouring? Is that outpouring available to us, guys? Was it only for the first century? No, it's readily there, and what do we need to do? We need to go to the power source, and we need to get it. Silly analogy, well, if your car is low on petrol, what do you need to do? And if you don't fill up, what will happen? And you'll go. <laughs> Who's ever had it happen? It's fun, isn't it? And come on, if you have an older car and say there's all sediment, there's all dirt and stuff filled in there, guess what can happen? Chuck, chuck, yeah, it goes into the injectors, goes into the line, and maybe it gets into your engine. Can you actually even destroy your car that way? And can you make a lot of damage from that? Yeah, so by running dry and all the rubbish that's in there, what can happen? Damage. So what happens? We need to be full of power, but we need to be filled with his grace. Did Stephen have the Lord's favor in that moment? He did, didn't he? And did he preach powerfully in that moment? And did he see the heavens open? Absolutely, because the favor of the Lord was upon him. So we need to make sure we are full of his power, full of his grace. And again, like I've said, this is the key verse, but this is the point. We need to draw near, guys. In Hebrews 4, 16, it says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence. Everyone say confidence. What does that word mean? What does confidence mean? Well, God, I guess if you want to give it to me, I'll, I'll, I'll come and get it. That's timidity, isn't it? Yeah. Or come on, guys. What's something, like I said, all mankind can struggle with? Shame. Well, you know what? I, I can't. But if we're really not receiving it, I know we don't think of it this way, but what is shame actually producing within us? It's saying what Christ did is not enough. That's actually what it's producing within us. That if we continue in that place of shame, of fear, of unbelief, it's saying what Christ did on the cross, that's not enough for me. But guys, did he reconcile mankind to himself? Did he pay the entire debt? Did he willingly do it for you and for me and for all mankind? So then what do we need to do? Receive it. We have to receive it. And as we receive it, we need to allow it to change us. And as he changes us, we grow in confidence. And what happens? We draw near with confidence to the throne of favor. When my kids need something, where do they go? Mommy and daddy. Who here can be honest and say, every time we need something, do you go to Father? I'm sorry, guys. We all don't. We all can, what, very easily just do it in our own efforts, can't we? Don't even think about it. And, oh, this needs to get fixed, and this needs to happen, and da-da-da-da. And we just do it. But what is Paul reminding us, the writer of Hebrews reminding us of here? That we need to, what, come to our dad and say, Dad, I need favor in this area. I need your help. He says, so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. All right, so I love, of course, little kids. You know, one of the beautiful, most beautiful things. You see a little kid, when their mom or dad comes in, mommy, daddy, and they run up and they grab them. And then what do they do? They climb up on their lap. And isn't that a beautiful thing? The love of a child and a parent. And again, how much more so with our Heavenly Father, that we receive this revelation. And when we have a need, what do we need to do? We need to run to Daddy. When we fall down, like you got a little kid here on the bike, right? Come on, what happens if a little kid falls down and scrapes their knee? They come running. Oh, oh, oh. oh what happened? Well, I was riding my bike and I fell down and there was a stone. <laughs> and they give you the whole sob story, right? 
But guys, do you know we can go give our stories to God? Amen. Okay? Now, don't give out to God. <laughs> uh, don't be going and say, God, why would you do this? Because then you know, you're very dangerous waters. But can you come and say, Lord, why did it happen this way? What's going on in this situation? I don't. Can you pour out your heart to God? Read the Psalms. David was very good at that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord, I feel like I'm in Sheol. I'm in hell. Lord, why are all my enemies against me? Why? And is he crying out to God? But then the important thing of every psalm, if you read it, what does it always end with? But God, I know you are good. God, I know you are on the throne. He proclaims the truth. He doesn't stay down where he was. He then exalts the name of the Lord. And in process, what's happening? He's being exalted. As we proclaim the truth, what happens? We are exalted. We are lifted up. And does God then give us favor? And does he lift us up as well? Does he help us? What does it say? In our time of need. Right? And like uh, I think I said it a couple Thursdays ago. You know when your time of need is? Every day. <laughs> All right. I want to blow again that out of the water, abiding, coming and receiving God's favor and grace in the traditional church. You know what we've received? We only come forward or we only talk to the pastor or we only tell our friends when we have a big need. When something's really bad. You know, if I break my legs, then I'll come forward for prayer. But you know, all the other times, I'm grand. I don't need anything. No, you do need something. You need his grace. You need his favor. You need power. You need to go to the source and receive more from the Holy Spirit. So that's why until the Lord comes, we're going to keep doing ministry and prayer the way we've seen revealed from the Lord. Because I see it all throughout the scriptures. They didn't just come in their time of need. And when they did, guess what happens, guys? That meant they had grown cold, and it meant they needed a revival. They needed to be revived. So we're supposed to stay in this place of constant abiding with the Lord, and it's not just here. I implore you, your personal walk with the Lord, do you need to daily be reading the Word of God? Do you need to be daily crying out and praying and drawing near to His throne of grace? Do you need to daily, what does it say? Whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever... We need to dwell on such things. Because what comes out of our mouth if we're not dwelling on God? Other stuff. What gets into our head if we're not dwelling on God? You know, the worries of life, lust, sin. Okay, it so easily creeps in, doesn't it? But if we are dwelling on the things above, what happens? We start to renew our mind and we have a heavenly mindset. Doesn't mean that we don't have issues, guys. Doesn't mean we don't stumble. And we don't even sin. We can, guys. But we are not practicing such things. That is not where our mind is dwelling. That's not where we are living out of. But we are living by his favor. And we are dwelling in that intimacy and relationship with God. And we need to, each one of us, continue to grow in that. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, right? Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So he ends the letter. So what are we supposed to grow in? His favor. All right. So if we're lacking favor in our life, what does it mean? We, go to the, we have to go to the one who gives favor. All right. We have to have faith and continue to grow in that area. We need to then what? Maybe lay down some things in our lives that are actually contrary to the will of God. Do you know we can have those things in our life, guys? Does anybody here have things that over the years you've realized, I really like that thing, but God is asking me to sacrifice it to him? All right, maybe we had a dream. All right, come on, I'm a music player. Anybody who's ever uh, been a musician, what's the dream? Jerry, what's the dream? You get famous. <laughs> you make lots of money. <laughs> All right, come on. And <laughs> it usually never happens. <laughs> All right. And in all reality, I have a major problem with that as I've grown the Lord. Why? Because who gave us the ability to make music? And then if we're using that for our own gain, we've got a problem, don't we? It doesn't mean we can't make a living from it, but it's meant to glorify him. And if we're using it for fame and fortune to get attention, we've got a problem, don't we? And let's say I had that desire when I was younger. I'm going to be rich and famous. And then I honestly went through this. And I had opportunity to sign a record deal and do all these things. And I said, no, because I felt the Lord saying, don't do that. That's not my will. And it wasn't a big deal for me, thank God. He had worked on my heart. But do you know a lot of people in that situation, you know what they had done? But that's my dream. That's my dream. I've grown up with that. And I've had people tell me over and over again, that's my dream. But is it his? 
All right, your dream is important. Don't get me wrong. God gives us desires in our hearts, but they need to come in line with his calling. So my gift for, obviously, musical talent, did the Lord still use it? Amen. Did he give it to me? And was it fulfilled, obviously, in the church? Amen. Okay, was it fulfilled even in outreach and things we've done over the years? Absolutely. But it needs to come into submission to his will, to his calling. And do you know what? A lot of people will have their dream and it's set up there, but we have to ask ourselves, well, is it God's will? And if it's not God's will, guess what? We might have to sacrifice it. Right, how many kids are taught to be famous? Well, God doesn't want us to be famous, does he? He actually wants us to be famous for him, but he doesn't want us to be famous for ourselves because then who's seeking the glory? Who's seeking the attention, the honor, all these things? And guys, what happens? Then pride can so easily come into us. But the point is we want to make his name famous. We want to bring glory to him. We want to honor him. So we are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. So as we mature in these things, I'm going to tell you guys, when I was a young believer, like I said, my mindset is completely different from what it was then. And I hope that's the same for you. I'm not saying the tendencies of the faith or what Christ did in our lives or all that, but the things that I had priority on, I realized, wow, God, that's not your priority. And it started to what? Rework in my life. And I'll tell you guys, it produced great fruit. In that place of obedience, God grew and matured me. Acts 13, 42 through 43. Paul and Barnabas were going out, and people kept begging them uh, that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. All right, beautiful thing. Now, when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and the God fearing proselytes uh, followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. So, do we have to continue in His grace? Do we have to even fight for it, guys? Okay, my job right now, what am I doing? Continue in it, guys. Fight the good fight. Grab hold of what Christ Jesus grabbed hold of for you. Don't let it go. Continue walking in the truth. And this is what we're Paul and Barnabas urging the early converts, if you want to say, believers, were they urging them to continue in the favor that they had received from God? Did we receive favor through Christ Jesus? Do we have to continue in it? And guys, do we have to even fight for it? You do. Because you know what? There's so many things. Has anyone noticed things come in and they try to knock us off course? They try to get us to go this way, just like the path here, to the right or to the left. But when you say, no, my eye is fixed on that prize. My eye is fixed on the calling that God has for me. And no matter what, life or death, if we go to Romans 8, right? Nothing can separate us from his great love for us. All right, that, that eternal covenant that was made through Christ Jesus, will God ever take it back? No way. no way. But can you walk out of that covenant? Okay. You can. And that should put, again, the fear of the Lord in us, that we say, Lord, I'm going to continue in it. Though none go with me, Lord, still I will follow. And we have to settle that in our hearts and continue to walk in the grace that he's called us to. In 2 Corinthians 5, and into chapter 6, Paul is teaching us about the grace that he's received, right? But then he's warning us that we need to make sure we continue in the grace that we've received. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. So we're, are we ambassadors for Christ? All right, Paul, was he representing Christ to the Gentiles? All right, so now, you who live here, we all live in Ireland, don't we? Has God called you to Ireland? doesn't matter what nation you're from. South Korea. South Africa, what else have we got here? Lithuania, Mauritius, yeah, Canada, okay, wherever it may be, Americans, and the Irish, and Brazil, and Filipino, we've got a lot here, and carry the kingdom. <laughs> they lost. <laughs> All right, that w the Lord, he has called you to this country. Do you have jobs in this country? Do you have houses in this country? Are you dwelling in this country? So why did God call you to this country? Mm-hmm. All right. Now, the other stuff, guys, maybe we came here for jobs. Maybe we came here for better living. Maybe we came here because we had family here or whatever it may be. Uh, persecution, absolutely. But what's the bigger picture? Why are you here? To be an ambassador for Christ to the Irish people. God has called. I'm going to put a little charge out here to you guys. If you're dwelling, it doesn't matter what nation you are from. 
right? We're the ones who get stuck on nations. We're the ones, I'm an American, right? Now, we can thank God for where we have been born, where we've come from, and we can honor our culture to a degree. But eventually, we have to say, well, I'm a citizen of heaven, okay? And if I'm a citizen of heaven, right, well, who is an ambassador? In the natural, what does an ambassador represent? The nation that they're from. So when we have to get something sorted, I have to go to Dublin, and I have to go to the American embassy. And what's there? Ambassadors who are here living in this country on behalf of my country. Well, guess what we are? We are citizens of So as we then walk on earth and dwell here, who do we represent? The king. <laughs> we are ambassadors for the king. And as we go into places and whatever nation God has called us to, what do we need to do? We need to remember we have been called to Ireland in this place to be ambassadors to the Irish to teach them the ways of God, to show them through my life as an example what God has done. He says, uh, yeah, as through God, we're making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. So over and time, over and over again, we see this time and time again uh, that the apostles, that the teachers of God, do you know what they always wanted to see? They always wanted to see people reconciled. They always wanted to come to them and say, guys, don't stay where you are. Continue on. Go forward. Overcome. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That statement is, oh, it's an amazing statement. You got to let that one sink in, guys. You got to let that one marinate within your spirit, within your soul, that through Christ Jesus, we have now been reconciled. That we have drawn near to his throne of grace and through Christ Jesus' sacrifice, now we are maturing, we are growing, and we know who we are, and we are the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now that's a perplexing line, isn't it? Because can you receive it in vain? You can. That's the implication, isn't it? We have received God's grace, and by faith we are saved, not by works, not by our own efforts, that any man might boast. But can you receive his favor? And then you can say, you know what? I'd rather have the world. I'd rather have my stuff. I'd rather have all the things that my family has who don't know God. I'm going to tell you right now, guys, Jesus was very concerned specifically about family. Many of the parables he gave, the examples that he gave, why did he say it in such a way? Because you know what? I, I, I hate to even say it. Nine times out of ten, I've talked to Christians. Do you know why they fall away from God? It's usually because of their family. Yeah. It's usually because of people in their family that don't know God or compromise on the faith or turn away or whatever it may be. And guess what? They say, well, you know what? I need to follow my family. Where this is why Jesus so strongly said, if anyone loves their father or mother more than me, they're not worthy of me. Because if that thing has a root, a hold on us, when something happens within our family, guess what can happen? It'll pull us. It'll tug us. So this is why we need to make sure our whole heart, who is our whole heart given to? Yeshua. Yeshua. There's this teaching out there that we give our heart to people. No. I give my heart to him, Amen. okay? And through that, him having my heart, then can I have ties with other people? Yes. But who are they through? Him. And if they're not through him, what will happen? We'll actually have ungodly connections. Yeah. All right, come on, guys. Let's be honest. What's something mankind really struggles with? Wanting to be liked. People-pleasing. Guys, did Peter struggle with that? Did. Peter did struggle with that majorly. And did it cost him dearly many times? Yeah, he was worried about everybody else. Well, who do we need to actually be concerned about? What he likes, what his desire is, what his will is. And do you know what? Everyone else, if they love Jesus, will they come in line and will we all do well together? And will we continue on in the faith? And will we mature and grow? And will we have, okay, that word, guys, remember fellowship? We're going to have it in a minute when we have a meal. But do you know what that word really means? It means covenant. It actually means to be united. So can I have fellowship with somebody who doesn't know Jesus? 
I actually can't. Because can I be united with them? I can love them. Can I have relationship with them? Can I want to win them to Christ and be an ambassador to them? But can I have fellowship with them? It's more intimate. And can you have, can light have fellowship with darkness? No. So someone even who claims to be a believer yet does not walk by the faith, can I have intimate fellowship with them? Can I try to win them? Can I love them through Christ Jesus? But can I abide and have fellowship with them? Did Jesus abide and have fellowship with everybody? Everyone always wants to say Jesus was the lover, the friend of sinners. No, he went into the sinner's home so they might turn from their sin and come into the knowledge of the truth and have fellowship with the true God. Yeah, new creations. He didn't go in there hanging out with them. And I'm going to tell you guys, come on, who's ever hung out with, it's nothing against people who don't know God. We love them. But who's ever put themselves in that situation and there wasn't a good outcome? Because you're influenced. And you compromise. Now, if we grow in maturity and we grow in the strength of the Lord, can then we be the influence in the situation? But we also need to remember, are there sin patterns or even tendencies in our lives? Can there be things we came out of? And let's just take drinking. Yeah, addiction, whatever it may be. If I had a tendency for that and I'm strong in God, but then my friends who do not know God or my family who doesn't know God breaks out all the stuff that I used to struggle with. And I feel that little thing in me saying, do it. What do I need to do? Run. <laughs> Pause, ask the Lord. Can he give you strength in that moment? He can. God is good. But more times than not, I've seen it in my own life, we need to take the Joseph approach. We need to get out of there. Because if we linger in that situation, it will not produce life. It will actually produce death. And again, we are called to be ambassadors to Christ. We represent him in that moment, and we do not want to receive his grace in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I listened to you, and on the day of salvation, I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. So when's the acceptable time? Right now. God is a God of now, guys. <laughs> as long as today is called, do you know what word of a lot of times? Tomorrow. <laughs> Anyone good at procrastinating? <laughs> okay. Now, I'm just talking silly in the natural. You know what the terrifying thing is? It's the same in the spiritual. Most people are procrastinating with their eternal destiny, and that's terrifying. <laughs> it's foolish. Because at the end of the day, do you know when your time is up? He does, because he says so. He says our times are in his hands. And when he says our time is up, our time is up. And then it's on us. Do we need to be ready? Do we need to be prepared? So as long as today is called today, as long as it is the acceptable time, we need to do it. He says, behold, now is the day of salvation. And this is an important line, giving no cause for offense in anything, so that the ministry will not be disregarded, but in everything, commending ourselves as servants of God, in much endurance, in affliction, in hardship, in distress, in beatings, in imprisonment. And if we jumped over to Romans 8 right now, guess what Paul says? None of that stuff will separate us from the love of God, Right? In tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in hunger, in purity, uh, in knowledge, in patience, in kindness, in the Holy Spirit, in genuine love. This is one of Paul's famous run-on statements. In the word of truth, in the power of God, by the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left, by glory and dishonor, by evil report and good report, regarded as deceivers and yet true, as unknown yet well known, as dying yet behold we live. Right? As punished, yet not put to death. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. What did Paul just describe to us? The Christian walk. <laughs> the fight of the faith. And what is he saying? We have nothing, but we have, we have everything. We go through persecution, yet we are not dead. He's saying that in this, we have a fight, guys. And do we feel it? Did they feel it? Guys, how much more so, Paul, when you read about all the things he had to endure for the gospel? We, we've, we're nothing to that level yet. And by God's grace, we have not received that. But he's reminding us that in all these things, what is the point of it all? To bring glory as ambassadors to the king and the kingdom. 
through the grace that has been extended to us, the favor. Did he call you guys? Are you here today because you heard the call of the Father? You heard the call of the Son, and he extended his favor to you, and that is not something we need to take lightly. We need to remember that and that we are ambassadors for the kingdom. And that line I have underlined there, giving no cause for offense. Do you know it will very quickly sever us? will actually bring in uh, a disconnect is offense. Okay? Now, he's talking about here that in what they do, they have to be careful. And, of course, we need to be careful that in everything, right, we're preaching the truth of the word of God. And when God's word comes, is it convicting? <laughs> is it challenging? Does it cut between and all these things? But we need to make sure. Do you know, guys, I could get up here and could I do a big old rant on being an American and how you guys need to get Americanized Christianity? How would you respond to that? <laughs> You'll leave. Could you have an offense? Could you get upset by that? And that offense, was it brought about because I'm preaching the gospel or I'm preaching something a little twisted? Okay? And now what we need to make sure in what that we are doing, we are not bringing offense. And we need to make sure something that is oh so vital to our faith is that we do not have a spirit of offense. Because as offense comes in against us, guess what happens, guys? It's like that nice little cut that never heals. And it grows gangrenous. And it gets bigger. And it gets bigger. And have you ever heard anybody giving out? Oh, my wounds, my wounds, my wounds. And what happens is because there's an offense there. And if we have an offense against somebody and we have not been reconciled or done what we can do to be at peace with all men, as it depends on our half, what will offense bring into our lives? Anger, bitterness, unforgiveness, jealousy. And do you know what it says? Where are those things? Disorder. Yeah, it'll actually bring sickness. So if there's any offense in us, the Lord is very clear when it comes to one another as believers, what do we need to do? We need to shred it. That's right. All right. Our good old uh, New York saying is get over yourself. Guys, we've got to move past it. And if we can't move past these things, do you know what will happen? It will actually break apart the body of Christ. And do you know who wants to do that? Satan. Yeah, the wicked one. He wants to break apart and bring in that dishonor. Yeah, absolutely. So as we have issues with one another, if I have an issue with my wife or she has an issue with me, do we have to talk it out, dear? And do we have to go through that? And do we need to have love for one another and care for one another? And do we need to speak the truth in that situation and not allow the deceiver to come in? Because the deceiver loves to come in in those situations. So we need to know the truth and we need to make sure that we, in those situations, as Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. That when we go into a situation, if we are sons of the living God, whose kingdom do we bring with us? If, you go into, if we went to the United Nations right now, they all have their pins. If they're an ambassador, and what do they say? Ambassador for Nigeria. Ambassador for Ireland. Ambassador, ambassador for all. So when we go in, what do we represent? The kingdom of heaven. And that pin is stuck on you. And you know what? It would do well for all of us to remind ourselves of that. Because then when we... we oh, where, oh, who do I represent? Uh-oh. <laughs> That's not his policy. That's my policy. <laughs> We need to make sure we are speaking the truth in situations. All right, we'll end there. Thank you, Lord. Let's stand up. Yeah, we'll end there. We might continue on next week. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord Jesus. Lord, we thank you again for your great favor, your grace, Lord, that you have extended towards mankind. Lord, that you love us so much that you continually pour out on us, that you continually, through your relationship with us, Lord, you desire that intimacy, that love. And Lord, we just ask this day again that we would grow in regards to the grace and the knowledge of the truth. Lord, that we would allow your truths to permeate us. Lord, that we would receive your favor and then we would go out and boldly walk in it. Lord, that we would bring the kingdom of God wherever we go because we have received favor from our great king. So we thank you this day, Lord, that as you say in your scriptures, we are to draw near. We are to draw near to your throne of grace. And in that place, Lord, we thank you. We find your mercy. 
we find help. We find your grace poured out on us, favor in our time of need. And Lord, if there's any pride, if there's any arrogance in us, if there's any sin or anything that would keep us from drawing near, may we lay it down again, be cleansed by the blood of Jesus, and with confidence run in before you, our great Father, and receive what you have for us. Lord, we just ask that you would stir that up within us more and more, that we would grab hold of the things that you are extending to us that we would grab hold of them like that little kid when a present is presented to them and rip it open, Lord, that we'd receive your great grace and that we would have that faith to step out and the things that you are calling us to, Father God, we thank you for the callings that you have on people's lives here. We thank you, Lord, that as we come into that intimacy and relationship with you, Father, that you reveal your will, your plan, and your destiny for each one of our lives. And Lord, we just ask that we would each grow in that today, knowing who our Father is and what His plan is for each and every one of us. And we thank you, Lord, for what that will produce, that identity that will come about from you, our Father God. In your precious name, amen.